comprado. Hey everyone, uh, welcome to the session on international perspectives. Um, just to give you a little bit of uh, sort of ground rules about how it's going to go, each of us are going to give uh, short 15 minute presentations. Some of us may take a couple questions during that, that period of time. And then we'll have the whole panel together at the end for a, a group q and I'll start out with a couple questions and then mostly I want to hear from, from you all and see, see what you think about these presentations. And just a, like a technical note, like if you do uh, speak up to ask a question, there's a red button in front of you by the microphone. So you push that once to turn it on, push it again to turn it off. Um, since the session's being recorded, that'll help make sure that the audience, wherever they are, uh, <laughs> will hear, um, we'll hear what we're up to. Um, my name is John Sutter. I'm a, a reporter with CNN and an explorer in the National Geographic Explorer Program. Um, I'm here to talk to you about uh, climate passports. I'm going to start off with a quick video first, though. If you burn a lump of coal somewhere, the carbon dioxide goes up into the atmosphere. And you know, carbon dioxide molecules are exceptionally stupid. They don't know anything about national boundaries. They don't have passports. They are wholly innocent of the important concept of national sovereignty. They just casually cross over national boundaries one after the other. There is a lesson. The world is a unity. The national boundaries have no bearing on these global environmental issues. So that was Carl Sagan. Um, the scientist, great scientific communicator. That, that presentation was in 1990. And it always impresses me looking back on the history of communication about climate change and the science of climate change, how long we've known all of this stuff, right? He put his finger on something that I think is still vexing all of us today and will continue to, ve to vex the planet for generations to come, potentially. And that's what he essentially calls the stupid, the stupid carbon problem. Um, which is that carbon dioxide molecules obviously don't obey national boundaries, and it creates this sort of complex moral dilemma, I think, uh, where you have you know, some countries, some people that are doing a lot to cause extreme warming, to cause the climate emergency, uh, and then you have other people who are affected by that. And, and this, this sort of dynamic obviously creates um, a lot of issues, especially with relation to the topic that we're all here to discuss, which is migration. Um, you know, you have countries uh, like this one, the United States, that has done more historically to cause global warming than any other country on the planet, um, polluting and doing things that are causing people all around the world to have to rethink where they live, how they live, and, and to, to change their way of life. Um, so you have this list of sort of the, the perps, so to speak, you know, the, the U.S., Europe, uh, China, and then you have, you know, a very different looking map that shows where people are most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. Throw all of this together in a moment where displacement is at an all time high. This is a report from the UNHCR that came out yesterday uh, saying there are 70 million displaced people uh, in, in the world, displaced mostly um, related to conflict. You can see that this is up considerably from even 10 years ago. And you see that displacement related to extreme weather and natural disasters is up. This is from IDMC. Um, and it's showing in blue, you can see people who are displaced related to extreme events. Um, there's 18 million weather related, 8.6 million flood related, 7.5 storms. And then on the other side, you see the orange, uh, which is displacement related to conflict, uh, armed conflict, 7.9 million. And so I don't think we always think of these things as a whole, but we live in this moment both of walls, where countries like this one are trying to put up barriers to entry um, on their national borders, but also of in, intense displacement and the refugee situation is, is, is more dire than it has been in, in recent memory. We also know that this is only getting worse. This is uh, just a snippet from a World Bank report um, estimating the number of internally displaced people by 2050 if no action is taken to mitigate global warming. And 
you know, you can see that this is in the millions of the pe millions of people. There are estimates that, that are above this. There are estimates below this. But the point is, it's it's a lot of people who face displacement um, related to things like extreme weather, uh, rising seas. Um, rising seas poses a, a particular, I think, moral issue when you think about countries like the Marshall Islands or Kiribati in the, in the Pacific. They could see their entire territory disappear in coming generations as as seas rise, and at that point, you essentially become a stateless person. So this raises, again, an important moral question, and that's what I mostly want to talk to you about in, in these few minutes, is what do we owe each other now in this dynamic where we have certain people in certain countries causing a problem that is diffuse and is affecting people all around the globe? And I want to suggest, based on the work of some people at the, uh, at the Potsdam Institute in Germany, um, they've put forward this idea of a climate passport. And I want to raise that as, as just a food for thought in this discussion, what that would look like and what it would mean to grant certain type of citizenship rights to people who are displaced across national boundaries um, by the effects of climate change. And I think to, to make sense of that idea and to really, you know, get it through our heads, it helps to look back in time. Um, if we rewind about 100 years, we can meet people like uh, Fyodor Nansen, who, um, does anyone here, a show of hands, know who this person is, just off the top? So about half, this is a group that's, pl that's plugged in. He um, was, uh, you know, a famous, like, Arctic explorer, a zoologist, a scientist. He made a name for himself um, in these forms of exploration. Um, but then he really came to have a different kind of notoriety uh, during and after World War II, um, uh, World War I, sorry, amid a massive displacement crisis in, in Europe and a refugee crisis. And what he ended up proposing that I think is remembered among people who um, study displacement but is forgotten among the general public uh, is what was called the Nansen Passport, which is this document that you see here that essentially granted rights to stateless people in the interwar period. So between World War I and World War II in Europe, there were about 10 million people that almost instantly lost their statehood. They had either fled their home country during the war or boundaries were redrawn in a way that they essentially didn't have citizenship rights in a documented passport sort of way. And so what Nansen proposed and brought into the world was this passport that had a limited sort of legal rights. It wasn't enforceable in some of the ways that, that a national passport would be, but it did grant you the right to travel, to work, and to live as this sort of in-between state person uh, during that period. It, has, it had a certain shelf life, uh, but it, it was it was it was critical in that moment. And if you read back on the history of, you know, how international law has developed around issues of displacement and refugees, it, it, this really was a critical moment. The introduction of the Nansen passport. Um, and for purposes of our conversation, I think it's interesting that it wasn't looked at on an individual by individual basis. It was like, here's the situation our society finds itself in. We have all these people who are displaced who are now effectively stateless how do we grant rights to all of them who are applying from a country that has, that has bought into this regime? So the person who's bringing this idea back into the world is not me. It's, it's this guy, John Schellenhuber, um, from Potsdam in, in Germany. And he started giving talks. Most recently, I, I was in um, Poland for the, the climate talks this last December. He gave a talk there on this idea of a climate passport um, being adopted into, into the international framework. Uh, and he's got it. He's gotten this in discussions in German politics. I think the German Green Party has adopted a climate passport in its it, in its platform, and he's trying to sort of raise this conversation globally. And I think it's an interesting one. Is the why the reason I'm I'm here talking about it. I think some of the details about how this would function are still being worked out, but the essence of it is that countries that have done a lot to contribute to climate change. So they're saying countries that have contributed more than two percent of historic emissions. Um, that they would be the countries that, that have to receive climate migrants under a climate passport regime, and that there would be some sort of process involving an international actor, it could be the IPCC, but also local and national level entities to assess regions of the world, not people, but regions that are uninhabitable or are becoming uninhabitable because of climate change or related to the climate crisis and that people in those zones could be granted rights to live and work and travel in the ways that you know, the rest of us um, enjoy.
this is an idea that's sort of been gaining steam over time. This is an op-ed from Michael Girard, uh, professor here at Columbia from uh, 2015, way back then, um, arguing that the biggest polluters in the world should let in climate migrants or climate refugees. And I'm using both of those terms. I know that the climate refugees, th that there is no legal status in international law, but I think that's the reason to talk about it um, rather than to necessarily avoid that term. And Michael Girard was arguing uh, like a proportional sort of structure on the idea of fairness, really, I think, saying that, you know, your proportion of historic climate emissions uh, should be the proportion of climate migrants that you take in. So he's using the example here of just sort of throwing out the number of 100 million people displaced. That would mean proportionally the U.S. would take in 27 million of those people as, again, the largest contributor to, to the climate crisis. The, the folks at Potsdam have a, a, a long and interesting history of getting big, bold concepts into the public discourse around climate change, notably the, the two degrees target, which is you know at the forefront of everyone's mind right now, that or 1.5. These are temperature thresholds that the, you know, most of the countries of the world have agreed to try to limit warming to those amounts. That means essentially getting the world to be carbon neutral by about 2050. Um, again, these ideas, I, I think the bolder they are, even if they seem implausible politically, one, it gets at this idea of fairness and it can get attention and traction in a way that, that others don't always necessarily. I, I just want to briefly mention that I don't think this is a, a, a silver bullet in terms of migration and, and climate. This is a picture from um, people disp displaced by uh, Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico, and I met this this family and a number of others living in Central Florida. Um, you know, people, uh, Puerto Ricans are American citizens and can move into the United States, the U.S. states, uh, you know, without any sort of documentation, and yet still there were incredible challenges that people were facing. Um, I met people who were homeless, who were living in motels. Uh, it, it, it can be a dire and, and costly situation, even if you have the political right to move. Here's another example. I, I was in Shishmaref, Alaska just last month, which is up by the Arctic Circle. This is a village that has voted multiple times to relocate, but they just don't have the funding to do that. The, the permafrost is thawing, the sea ice is melting, their way of life is changing, and it's become dangerous to live there. They've decided that they want to leave, but they can't for financial reasons. So these things wouldn't be fixed by this issue of national boundaries. But I do think the conversation about these international borders can trigger a sort of moral thinking around this issue that is important and could help all of these causes. And as one final example, I, I, I want to mention a, a trip that I, I took down to Honduras in December uh, to, to do a story on the, the migrant caravan. Um, the two caravans of people that headed from Central America towards the United States last year. The discussion around that was largely that this is related to violence, it's related to poverty. Those things are factors in Central America, but in certain regions of the dry corridor, there also has been an intense and in some ways unprecedented drought. And so I want to introduce you quickly to one family who I met down there. And I think this sort of complicates the narratives that we hear about displacement often. Antes, sí, yo vi a madre de pero ahora, casi que, que no, porque las milpas que hubieron ese año casi que no, no se dio nada. Delmi has been struggling to feed herself and four kids these days. The crops just aren't growing like they were. Conditions eventually got so bad that her husband, Germán, fled Honduras for the United States, part of the migrant caravan that attracted the ire of U.S. President Trump. And in that caravan, you have some very bad people. Their story is different from others you've heard. Herman didn't join the caravan because of violence in his homeland. He left because of drought and climate change. Central America has been hit with an intense and unusual drought in recent years. Crops are failing, starvation is lurking. The UN says two million people in the region are at risk for hunger. We have seen uh, events of uh, children actually dying out of uh, hunger. So it is that extreme. These people are moving away, basically, they, because they have no option. That family, um, Delmi and Herman's family, uh, lives in sort of the, the orange spot that you see between Guatemala and, and Honduras. Uh, 
when you look at the projections in the future, the situation that they're going through is likely to spread across of uh, essentially the whole of Central America. And I want to emphasize, I think lost in the conversation about migration often is, is how difficult a decision, if we can call it a decision, it is to leave your home and the place that you know, and how incredibly risky that journey is. Um, while uh, after Herman left in one of the caravans, Delmi didn't have a phone, and so she would try to get news uh, of how he was doing um, from watching TV at a neighbor's house. And she would look for his face in these scenes of people jumping from bridges, crossing into Guatemala, um, getting tear gassed at the at the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, and eventually, she got a call from a neighbor saying that he died on the route um, in Guatemala, and. There's just this incredible toll that these migrations take on people. Um, in their case, you know, their family paid the ultimate price because he left to try to make a better life um, for his family. And so I think if we reframe these issues of migration and citizenship and climate in terms of fairness and equity and what we owe each other, then this, this big climate problem suddenly seems a lot simpler to me. Thank you. Good morning. I'll save you some trouble. You can call me Bala. Okay. I'm an urban planner. Um, I was living the peaceful life of an urban planner when the region where I lived got hit with an earthquake and that sort of got me into post-disaster recovery planning. Um, starting with the Gujarat earthquake, um, I was responsible for leading a team of planners who planned the reconstruction of the city and since then I've worked in recovery planning quite a bit. So three years back I decided to step back from practice and uh, work on a PhD program at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign with Professor Robert Olshansky who has studied post-disaster recovery across the world uh, and together we have been um, uh, in, in the first part of my uh, research we have been looking at multiple cases of disaster induced relocation to try and understand what sort of patterns emerge. And my uh, dissertation research is on uh, coastal Louisiana. I am just about to start the field work starting uh, Monday. Uh, and so what I'm presenting here uh, is what we have learned from our uh, uh, work on looking at multiple cases from across the world. We have drawn quite a bit from our own personal experiences, mine of working in post-disaster situations and his of studying a wide range of uh, recovery processes. So the, the reason why I thought this would be relevant to the discussion on managed retreat is that uh, you know, we, we are looking at uh, well, managed retreat is sort of an emerging area of work, as everybody is acknowledging at this conference, and the scale is uh, sort of unprecedented. But the fact is, displacements by disasters have been happening quite a bit over uh, the years. And I drew this uh, graphic from the same source, IDMC. Uh, you know, on average, 
in the period 2008 to 16, 25 million people have been displaced every year, and 86% of that is weather related. And all of them face the uh, question of whether to return or relocate. Now, that sounds like a binary. It is often discussed as a binary, but in reality, it is not a binary. It, it's, it's, there are lots of uh, shades of gray in between uh, return or relocate. Now, uh, relocation disrupts communities. And planners and planning processes have a major role to play in how that uh, unfolds. And that is why I'm, as a planning practitioner, I got interested in this. So when I uh, talk about community relocation, I'm uh, talking about both the relocation of individual households and groups. The key criterion is that relocation disrupts community. So if a lot of individual households are uh, getting, say, buyouts and moving out, and that uh, reduces the viability of that community, then that is uh, community relocation for me. Uh, I'm looking at both preemptive and post-disaster relocation. I'm looking at both uh, acute hazards or sudden onset disasters and chronic ones or slow onset disasters. Um, and you know, not just looking at the probability of an acute hazard event occurring, but also uh, of a chronic hazard reaching a tipping point. So we started off by um, listing out uh, the cases that we are familiar with. Um, um, Rob has done a lot of work uh, in the US, in Japan, in China, in New Zealand, Taiwan, Philippines, and India. And my field experience has been largely in India, but also in a in few countries in that region. Uh, uh, we were uh, looking for cases that covered a range of uh, you know, hazards as well as contexts. Um, and what we saw is that uh, there are sort of three streams of literature, uh, you know, in in this overall uh, context. One is of most interest to us as planners, um, which is planning for post-disaster recovery. Uh, the second is coming from the experiences of international development organizations and deals with uh, both development uh, related resettlement and uh, resettlement for risk reduction. And the third one coming largely from the fields of anthropology, sociology and geography uh, looks at the social dimension of, of relocation. And we also saw that the predominant type of literature that's of use to us was case studies which really go into the details of a particular case of relocation. We also saw that there were two broad approaches visible. One is a risk management sort of approach, which tries to uh, reduce uh, all risks to measurable and manageable ones. And the other one is a political economy approach, which really looks at the structural causes of, uh, of vulnerability and, and how that manifests in a, a disaster context. Uh, in yesterday's opening event, I, I could sort of feel that tension between the risk management approach and the structural approach. Uh, so that's uh, of great interest to me. Now, the research uh, framework uh, uses six elements. The four on the left side uh, relate to the process of relocation, starting with the uh, natural signs and the risk assessment based on scientific uh, criteria, then the risk decision, who decides how um, uh, the, the you know whether or not relocation is to be done, then the relationship of place uh, that the community has, um, and finally the details of the relocation process, how it unfolds, and the cross-cutting themes are the political and historical context in which this happens, and issues related to land and money, which often uh, turn out to be critical. So what we did is we selected 50 odd cases which cover a range of hazards a range of socio-political context, uh, a range of processes that were used for relocation and different outcomes from those. And we uh, scanned the literature using keywords related to the research framework that I showed earlier, and then we tried to identify patterns, uh, similarities in, in the context process outcome relationship across hazards. So now I'll uh, sort of run through the key insights that we uh, have come up with so far when you uh, starting with the science 
so I'm, I haven't tried to sort of exemplify the uh, scenarios uh, in three categories. At one extreme is where the situation where land is lost and there is no option but to relocate. So that would be situations like landslides, uh, subsidence, uh, coastal erosion, etc. Where there is, you know, it's, it's pretty obvious that people have no choice but to move. But even there, there are uh, gray areas, I would say. At the other extreme uh, are situations where the science really doesn't support relocation. In my own experience, in, in the post-earthquake situation in Bhuj, the city where I worked, uh, there was no justification to move people away because the whole region was, uh, you know, uh, equally at risk. But there were other dynamics at play which led to partial and voluntary relocation. And then there are uh, a lot of uh, uh, situations in between where there is a recurring hazard, um, and so there there could there is a situation where people are, uh, have uh, episodic disruption of life and therefore it might make sense to move but then it should be their choice not somebody else's. Uh, next we come to uh, the risk decision who decides and how. So it, it, you know coming from the natural science uh, aspect of this is a rational technical policy framework which is usually put in place uh, by agencies that uh, are responsible for taking that decision and from that flows the uh, policy decisions that then influence the way in which institutional processes um, uh, are framed and uh, leads to the you know the level of community engagement or autonomy uh, you know that actually uh, is available um, and all these three things end up influencing the individual uh, or collective relocation decision. To give an example uh, from the US, it, after, the, after Hurricane Floyd, uh, when Princeville um, had uh, you know, to decide whether to rebuild in situ or, or move, then there was this uh, policy framework where the, the, the community had to collectively decide where, you know, so it was either everybody gets a buyout or nobody gets a buyout. And at that point, the community uh, decided to rebuild and not move. Now the situation is a little different, but uh, that was their decision then. Uh, in contrast, um, after the Indian Ocean tsunami um, in Sri Lanka and after Typhoon Yolanda in, in Philippines, uh, when arbitrary buffers were uh, established uh, for communities to move back, then the outcome was not uh, so, you know, Clear. I mean, a lot of some people moved, a lot of people didn't, and you know, it, it, the outcome was very different. Uh, now, settled communities are where they are for a reason, uh, many reasons actually, and I've kept tried to capture the uh, main ones here. The most important one is history. Um, and cultural identity. There are also, you know, social networks in place which create social capital. And the most uh, uh, critical one, in a sense, is the relationship of that of the relationship of livelihood. And in the case of managed retreat, that becomes critical because for coastal communities, uh, proximity to to the coast is is so important for their uh, livelihood and uh, way of life. The devil is in the details. So the relocation process, uh, uh, you know, involves three big boxes. One is about institutions. Second is about policies, and third is about processes. And when it comes to processes, you'll see again that you know community engagement and autonomy in decision making plays a critical role. So to give an example from Bhuj, where I worked, and the initial uh, policy for uh, reconstruction was framed, uh, there was uh, an emphasis on uh, homeowners as opposed to renters. So there weren't enough uh, you know, housing assistance offered to renters, and that resulted in a whole bunch of uh, families being left out initially in the reconstruction process. And this uh, is visible in a lot of other places as well. So the, the reconstruction process or the relocation process doesn't happen in a vacuum. Uh, it happens in a political and historical uh, context. So often when we are talking of displacement and relocation um, as a uh, you know, way of 
moving people out of harm's way, there are other things in the background uh, that one needs to consider. To go back to the Sri Lanka example, uh, when the arbitrary buffer uh, was established, tourism industry was excluded, was exempted from that. So it, it you know, the opposition basically said that uh, this is a way of grabbing land uh, for tourism. So that sort of background is always uh, there and needs to be examined if uh, you know before one draws conclusions on this. Land and money. Uh, this is again uh, an issue, a set of issues that come up everywhere. So as I mentioned, the the differential treatment of owners and tenants. That's something that keeps coming up uh, in all the uh, cases of relocation customary uh, land title uh, being ignored. Um, there are many cases that uh, we looked at uh, in this context. The funding agency dynamics and the implementation mechanism is also uh, something that uh, plays a critical role. There is a lot of work done by Jennifer Diane Berenstein, uh, part of that in, in, in after the Gujarat earthquake, where she examines how uh, the uh, influence of uh, you know funding mechanism results in certain kinds of implementation processes and she ended up recommending uh, owner driven approaches and you know that eventually ended up uh, in 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 a, in a sort of a movement called the owner driven reconstruction collaborative which i've also been part of during my practice in india we're also working on sort of refining the framework by uh, developing typologies for each of these, uh, you know, elements of the framework. Now, one of the things that I uh, noticed is that the discourse on relocation is dominated by hazard risk and cost, whereas uh, actually there are lots of other uh, risks that people encounter, such as li risk to livelihood, social capital, political capital, historic values, and cultural identity, and people actually negotiate between these risks. So my doctoral research is focused on understanding how planners and planning processes play a role in this risk trade-off. I'm also interested in the temporal dimension of the risk trade-off. Um, so basically, uh, the prioritization of hazard risk over other risks changes with the time distance from the uh, from the disaster. So, in the case of acute hazards, uh, people prioritize hazard risk just after the event. Uh, in the case of uh, chronic hazards, uh, people prioritize hazard risk as they approach the tipping point and. This is uh, what I um, intend to explore in my doctoral research. Um, I think I'll skip the conclusion. Yeah, Thank, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, very pleased to be here. My name is Sandy Bizarro. I'm uh, based at the Global Climate Forum in Berlin. Um, and yeah, I'm happy to have uh, the opportunity to speak to you um, about um, an OECD report um, that I and colleagues at the Global Climate Forum have contributed to on kind of um, national approaches to coastal adaptation in OECD countries. Um, I think this is maybe um, takes a step back from 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 the local level what we've what we've heard in the last two talks and kind of frames I hope this this issue of managed retreat from the perspective of um, global costs of of sea level rise impacts um, and adaptation but also gives a bit of a perspective on what um, OECD countries are currently doing in terms of adaptation and how that kind of feeds into or shapes um, what can be done at at the local level in terms of um, what we've been speaking about yesterday and today um, in terms of, um, yeah, addressing retreat and um, relocation um, uh, at the coast. Um, so in, just in terms of what I'm going to speak about, I'll, I'll give a bit of an overview of, of, of the project, what, what, what the report is about, and then get into the content of it in terms of this 
um, global picture of cost of sea level rise and, and implications, what the countries are doing, <coughs> and what kind of conclusions come out of that. Um, in terms of why focusing on, on coastal adaptation, well, I think this is not something new um, here for, 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 for all of us, but essentially um, we, have, uh, we have coastal risks that are being dealt with currently that we've heard about um, the, the last uh, day and a half, um, and sea level rise will add to that in terms of um, changing um, return periods for extreme events, coastal flooding, um, salinization, coastal erosion, and the kind of um, hypothesis and, and the request for this uh, report from um, OECD mem member countries is that actually current institutions and governance structures are not very well equipped to uh, deal with how these ri uh, risks will um, increase in the future. Um, so what we've done in the report and how that's kind of structured um, is, is along um, these, these three kind of components that you see on the left-hand side. So first kind of understanding the problem, f framing these risks. Um, so what, what kind of, um, what kind of uh, expected damages and, and, and costs and what kind of um, adaptation options are, are, are possible um, uh, over the course of the, 20, of the 21st century? So we've, we've done some modeling work at the global level um, to kind of get into that. Um, then what, again, what kind of approaches, um, what, what's happening in countries that, that uh, has been done through a kind of scan of national adaptation plans in OECD countries, as well as speaking with, um, with experts um, in countries to, to get an understanding um, and kind of uh, validate what, what, what we've been finding um, in the literature. And then kind of drilling into a few case studies, um, four, four, four case studies in particular, Germany, Canada, New Zealand, and the UK, to understand how these uh, issues play, in play out in practice and, and to find out what works. I'll speak about one of those case studies um, here today. So in terms of the kind of global picture of, of adaptation costs and, and, well, sea level rise impacts, um, so this is some modeling work, um, yeah, as, as I mentioned, done by, um, <coughs> by uh, colleagues at the Global Climate Forum. What you, he what you see here um, is a picture of uh, sea level rise scenarios over the course of the 21st century. Um, those kind of shaded areas, the blue and green, are what you may be familiar with, the kind of likely range of sea level rise scenarios from IPCC AR5. Um, so that likely being uh, a 66% chance, in the opinion of the IPCC, that sea level rise will uh, fall within that range. Um, the divergence between the glue, blue and green Shaded areas are, of course, different emission scenarios over the course of the um, over the course of the 21st century. What you see uh, with the red line here is making the point that actually um, um, that there are other possibilities. Sea level rise could end up being a lot worse. Um, a lot of that, or I mean, that discussion is basically around what's happening with the um, the Antarctic ice sheets and, and um, <coughs> ice sheet dynamics there. It's very difficult to kind of associate um, uh, probabilities to this, um, to these, to these events. But yeah, there are studies um, in published studies in the literature saying that sea level rise could be on the order of uh, two meters uh, by the end of the century due to those um, those those ice sheet dynamics. Um, <clears throat> I mean, how does that translate into kind of the economic costs of sea level rise? Um, what you see here. Um, uh, is a, a global assessment of um, economic damages based on those different um, scenarios. Um, uh, and we've, we've done that for different sea level rise scenarios as well as different socioeconomic scenarios. What you see in the top row there is basically economic damages from um, changes in um, expected uh, um, return levels of, of uh, extreme water levels, so flood damages um, for different scenarios. The top, uh, the top uh, row is without adaptation, um, and you can see there we have uh, extremely high costs on the order of, yeah, uh, hundreds of trillions of U.S. dollars, 4% of annual GDP um, by, by 2100. The message here is that adaptation actually reduces those costs substantially. So the bottom row you can see there, across all scenarios, um, sea level rise or socioeconomic scenarios, we have a, a two to three um, uh, uh, order of magnitude reduction um, in the cost of adaptation. So 
there's, uh, or sorry, in the, in, in, in the impacts of sea level rise with adaptation. So there's a clear economic case um, for adaptation. I mean, what needs to be said there as well, however, is this doesn't come for free. So the investment needs um, to, to, to achieve that reduction are, are substantial. Um, we see that, um, yeah, for, for high-end sea level rise, we have up to 70 billion uh, U.S. Uh, dollars potentially by the end of the century to, um, uh, to, to adapt, so to, to achieve those um, uh, reductions in expected impacts. Um, what you see is that those costs um, are, are similarly high across all socioeconomic scenarios, but we have a, a pretty strong divergence after 2050 in terms of costs um, associated with high-end sea level rise versus lower-end sea level rise. So the message here, of course, is that um, even though adaptation achieves benefits, it's clearly um, not a case to say we need to do nothing in terms of uh, mitigation. These are complementary responses, and costs are going to be much higher um, if we go down that um, high-end sea level rise path. How does that look in terms of um, kind of the global... Um, well, spatial distribution, if you want, of these impacts. So that, again, this is analysis um, um, uh, by colleagues published last year um, in Global Envi Environmental Change of, um, um, uh, of, well, this is essentially an uh, analysis of kind of what is and where is investment in adaptation robust. So what you see here um, is uh, a mapping of an analysis of, uh, of the benefits of adaptation across um, uh, the, all the socioeconomic, those five socioeconomic pathways, so different pathways of socioeconomic development, as well as different pathways uh, or different scenarios of sea level rise, including high level sea level rise up to two meters. Um, and what the green indicates uh, on the map is um, for all those scenario com combinations, green indicates in 100% in of those, so across all those scenario combinations, um, you have a positive benefit cost ratio for adaptation. So regardless of what happens with sea level rise and socioeconomic development, it makes economic sense uh, to invest in, in adaptation in those areas. The red is the opposite. That's for, for, for no uh, combinations of, of uh, sea level rise and socioeconomic development do you have a positive benefit a cost rate ratio or positive uh, net present value of investing in adaptation. And the message here is that, I mean, um, that for, um, uh, for densely populated urban areas, uh, essentially, even in the face of these uncertainties of sea level rise, there's an economic case. You see the green, um, you know, in, in, in northwestern Europe, on the American eastern seaboard, uh, for, for, for the coastal megacities in, in Southeast Asia. It makes sense to invest in adaptation, um, regardless of what happens in terms of uh, sea level rise. If we get high end or low end, there's still an economic case for that. So what does it tell us? Um, well, I mean, of course, this is a global uh, analysis, so there's some caveats uh, uh, that, are, that are very important to mention here. Um, this, this analysis is, is um, been done with respect to, um, to protection. And um, you know, for local coastal, coastal planners, this provides kind of an entry point for thinking about how actually we want to deal with adaptation. It, it, it presents an economic argument for saying that there's benefits for thinking about that. Uh, but, of, of course, we want to consider a broader range of adaptation me measures and account for timing and fle flexibility when we actually go into the, to the local um, level. And, I mean, uh, another important point to mention here is that, um, of course, adaptation makes economic sense. Um, as, I, as I mentioned, for a large uh, portion of, um, of coastal, global coastal populations and assets, but there's that issue, again, about um, emphasizing assets versus population, and we need to find a way um, to um, account for the fact that um, we, if, if we base our decisions purely on this type of analysis, we end up investing in places where assets are already valuable, and um, we need to find a way to deal with these distributional issues um, that, that can emerge um, uh, and, and basically lead to kind of bifurcation, if you want, of coastal um, futures. Um, if I can move on now to, to what actually is being done, um, this kind of policy scan of, um, of what's being done in OECD countries with respect to coastal adaptation. Um, so as I said, this has been, been done through a review of national adaptation planning, and we've kind of um, 
looked at these three categories of policy um, instruments, if you want information provision, regulatory instruments, that, and then the dedicated national funding to kind of review what's ac actually happening at the country level. Um, clearly, and that's not very surprising, there's a lot more um, action in terms of um, information provisioning. 25 countries are doing that, um, less in terms of uh, regulatory economic instruments and very little in terms of dedicated national funding for coastal adaptation. Um, so what is happening is you generally have downscaled regional climate projections, uh, projections and hazard maps as well as guidance for local planners issued by, by national um, governments. In terms of regulatory and economic instruments, um, we see uh, particularly in Europe already mainstream of sea, uh, mainstream of sea level rise risks into into land use planning into master uh, master planning um, for 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 coastal land use as well as integration um, into infrastructure standards so in Germany now um, coastal uh, uh, protection so embankments are being widened by between two to to, to five meters um, so that um, it becomes then cheaper in the future uh, if you have to retrofit or deal with um, upgrading dikes uh, due to um, unexpected or faster sea level rise than maybe you were planning for. This is cheaper and that, that's, that's coming to kind of the infrastructure standards there. And in terms of <coughs> uh, funding, there's very little action here. Um, uh, th so very little, little in the way of dedicated funding for coastal adaptation. What is there is also bears mentioning that it's very much focused on existing measures. And so uh, protection, again, being an example um, where, where, where dikes have, have been built and that can kind of lead to a lock-in um, and um, limit the discussion um, from the national level uh, in terms of what might be possible in terms of adaptation at, uh, at local regional scales. Um, I've got a short bit of time left. I'd just like to uh, speak about one particular case here to sh illustrate how we're trying to kind of zoom into the local level. This maybe um, uh, just sit back there for a second. Uh, um, zoom into the local level and look at uh, one instance of of, of, of retreat um, in, in, in Canada, not so far from here in Nova Scotia. We do have, uh, we have looked at other cases uh, in the report, but basically what, what, what we looked at in uh, Truro, uh, Nova Scotia was um, an instance of, of uh, salt uh, marsh restoration. Um, this is a this is a community um, um, that's that's faced kind of um, frequent f uh, flooding and has been um, uh, protected by around 240 kilometers of of dike, which you see there. Um, well, it's a bit difficult to see, but actually the the white dashed line um, is is part of uh, the the old dike. Uh, that under kind of uh, provincial standards needed to be updated to deal with sea level rise risks. This was becoming increasingly co costly and there, through a kind of discussion with multiple uh, stakeholders and private landholders in the community, um, there's now uh, plans underway to uh, kind of breach the dike, which is the dashed white line you see in the, in the, in the, uh, in, in the figure, um, and then rebuild a shorter dike and allow some of the land to be um, restored as, as salt marsh. Um, and so we've um, kind of been speaking with people involved in the process there to kind of um, try to understand what led to success there. Of course, um, a, a lot of the initial discussion um, in terms of the planning process in the ur urban or in the, in the setting in Truro focused around um, status quo, um, hard options, um, and was uh, it was difficult to kind of overcome the multi-scale issues in terms of provincial and federal responsibilities as, as well as urban um, or, or local uh, local responsibilities um, and funding was also an issue there but that's been overcome uh, as, as they've kind of uh, put together a community uh, group to, to deal with that so I think I'm, I, I'm I'm out of time there so I hope that that was uh, interesting uh, for you and kind of frames a bit the discussion that we've had already the reports available online if you'd like to, to have a look there and uh, thanks very much for your time.
Uh, I mean, the I map that, I, that okay. I showed there um, is kind of robust analysis uh, of Costa and that includes the high end, so it's a pretty clear scenario there. Okay. 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 Um, no, I mean, certainly, I mean, I, I think, Thank you, everyone. Um, it's it's. I'm pretty pleased to be here and um, to share with you um, what we in the Caribbean already know, and um, that is retreat for us is both a verb and a noun. Because if you're if you're a tourist destination, then of course retreat takes on a different meaning entirely, in the sense that this is where people come to rest and, 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 and escape. And so that in itself is a retreat. And, and the question is, how do we manage that? How do we manage that for ourselves? How do we manage that for those who, who find um, our location and our way of life attractive? And so um, that throws you know, a whole different dimension to the concept of managed um, retreat. Um, I currently live in Houston. Geogra a geographer by um, training, um, expanded population and sustainable development. But I, I work for the school district, but I keep an independent um, research portfolio in keeping with my dissertation on, on disasters, particularly um, education in emergencies and how we, we fit education into, into that, not just as a um, uh, it's a curriculum-based activity, but as a sector and, and, and spaces for learning. And, and of course, preparing um, another generation of researchers and, and creating, by extension, a culture of safety in environments like, like the Caribbean that um, what I consider uh, have chronic exposure to, to disasters. And um, this is part of a larger study that I'm doing looking at um, disaster policy shifts in the Eastern Caribbean and um, what does that look like and what are some of the issues, the troubling issues that surface in those and, and of course what are some of the successes. And, and this is the agenda, I look at the background study area, risk and vulnerability from response to resilience. How did the shift happen? And I will take you through um, what I'm actually doing and of course um, my references. Disasters present, as you know, um, it's, it's, it's very common um, in the disaster literature. Um, windows of opportunities for change, adaptation, and building resilience. And there are two um, theoretical frameworks. There are many others, but there are two that, that I'm particularly interested in. And um, they both um, proceed that, that or argue that disasters are triggered, well, well um, change is, is triggered by disaster events and impacts. Um, that change occurs in phases over time and, 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 and each entailing a set of, of contextual factors with inputs and resources and those are transacted by change agents. And then you have, you know, another view that suggests that the disasters present a series of direct impact and corresponding changes, and those in turn lead to a set of changes, a cascading of, um, of changes. However, you will find that much of the research focuses on the outcome, not the processes of change. And because much of that work is done on hindsight, people go back and they look and see what has, has, what has happened as a result. And I have a few examples here. Um, the Indian Ocean tsunami in 2004 um, wasn't um, written about in respect to windows of opportunities in 2008. Hurricane Mitch 1998, Sweeney and Combs 2011, Hurricane Floyd in 1999, and it wasn't until 2017 in hindsight that you go back and see what was happening. So you miss the, the processes, and so my attempt here um, is to get the processes. I hope my and so, um, for those of you who are not familiar, because very often we're confused with the Dominican Republic, 
So I wanted to show you exactly where we're located in relation to the Dominican Republic. That tiny little speck you can see there. And I've expanded to show you not just um, the country's geography, not just, sorry, it's geography, but its size. Um, you can see all of the communities located along the coast. You can also see, I also want you to capture the, 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 the topography goes up to um, um, 1,200 meters on either end of the country. You have these huge um, peaks over, over 4,000 feet. And um, once, once you get the, 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 the visualization, you can understand any, any moisture-laden wind coming across the Caribbean has this orographic lifting. And then, you know, um, we have about 300 inches of rain year in places. Um, when I go through this, you can look at the photograph. You can see how these sediments just literally bury. And that's from, from um, Tropical Storm Erica and um, have literally buried these communities. And so Dominica represents a unique site to trace um, disaster adaptation and resilience. The island is small, as you can see. Population is also small. It's one of the most rugged countries in the world. In fact, it is believed that after Switzerland, well, Switzerland is the only country that is more rugged than Dominica. And um, sorry for my spelling here, but 70% of the population live within a narrow coastal and river floodplains. And you have a GDP um, 2007 from the World Bank of US. Uh, US um, 516, I think that should be 2017, 516 um, million U.S. dollars. <coughs> what are the risks and vul vulnerability? Uh, Dominica is considered one of the most vulnerable countries in the world. Hurricanes, volcanoes, and earthquakes. It has a 10% chance of being brushed or hit directly by a hurricane every year with average wind speed of 110 miles. I think that's category two. You have frequent hurricanes with devastating effect based on 140 years of data. And what we've, what, what we've seen based on, 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 on that data is that um, the country can be hit or brushed every two and a half years. And that the hurricane doesn't have to be within close proximity because of the, the topography. In 2011, Ophelia, the center of Ophelia was 250 miles from Dominica, and yet the effect was so devastating. The outer bands cut the island, and what you had was this orographic lifting, as I mentioned, and therefore tremendous flooding, um, debris flow, and, and it was just total destruction. Hurricane presents a four-pound threat in Dominica, not only you have the gale for winds, you have sea swells, you have floods, and you have slope failure. And I'd written about that um, a few years ago. The mountain trigger, as I mentioned, orographic lifting and excessive rain, so over 300 inches of rain per year. Evacuation is not an option, except to hurricane shelters. And you heard um, my colleague earlier talk about the, 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 the migration experiences these days and how difficult and challenging it is to leave your borders. And, and that for us is not an option. The longest gap that we've had between a hurricane has been 20, 10 years, and that's only between 1934 and 1945. Hurricane force winds can last on average 14 hours during direct hits. The most recent ones I mentioned, 2011, Eric Ophelia, a tropical storm, Erica, 2015, and Hurricane Maria, Category 5, in 2017. The impacts of Ophelia were uncertain, but I want you to see what happened in Erica. It was only a tropical storm, but 483 million, or 90% of the country's GDP. And Maria, $103 billion, and 226% of the country's GDP, the photograph shows you what happens when these storms pass through. Here was Hurricane Ophelia, that photograph, and right next to this is a school, and um, I actually had this as a video, but took it off, where you could actually hear the kids screaming, the kids screaming and a teacher in the background trying to calm the kids down. <laughs> 
And here you have Ophelia actually breaching um, the, the, the banks of a nearby river and literally rushing through the street and taking everything with it, cars, whatever it could find, um, down. Um, and actually, this is my community. <laughs> so you can, you can imagine I'm having to experience that. So what has happened? How have we moved from response? Initially, what we did was just respond to the disasters. And quickly we realized this is not going to work. We, we, we need to take a different approach. How did we do that? First, there was this regional approach. We had the Caribbean Disaster and Emergency Response Agency that was turned now into a management agency and given full responsibility for comprehensive disaster management throughout the region. We also have the catastrophic, um, Caribbean Catastrophic Risk Insurance Facility that is run by, <laughs> and I'm, there's, there's a World Bank colleague here, by the World Bank and several other um, countries that actually feed into that actually pay money and, and, the, and the countries the Caribbean countries actually do and they can draw down on that in in times of yeah of disaster at the national level you have incremental changes to the building construction material we move from wood to crown concrete um, we we now declare the state of emergency before the disaster to give us ample time to to mobilize people to mobilize equipment and, and to be able to, to respond. We now take an interorganizational approach to disaster management, so we bring all of the stakeholders and they form the, 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 the disaster management um, committee. Um, of course, uh, under that is the Office of Disaster Management. And the Prime Minister now heads the disaster management committee. Of course, the Prime Minister has a lot of leverage and he runs that stuff and therefore he's able to, 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 to to mobilize people and resources. And we also have what we call a low carbon climate resilience strategy. Work that I had done previously indicated that Dominica is a net remover of, of, of carbon. And that has been able to, to, to provide for us access to funding from several international agencies. And then you have the community-based approach. I want you to look at this picture. Here is a community under Erica that was totally devastated. And you can see the series of um, slope failure, landslide, and that entire community had to be evacuated. Now, this is a region that is also the vegetable basket for the country. All of the vegetables that come to market, most of it comes from that area. But the place was so devastated, you had to move all of these people out of here and reestablish them in a new community. We have also have um, um, the establishment of community disaster management committees. We have training for those committee members. You have local councils now partnering with government for the implementation of climate resilience strategies. And you have a network of health centers already existed and have been upgraded to strengthen, particularly for response and um, recovery. And then you have, now this is the community in which they were moved into. We now call it a model resilient community, underground telecom cables, concrete blocks, heap roof, corrugated galvanized, rafted and beams that are fastened with hurricane ties, hurricane resistant windows, and they were able to resist the Category 5 Maria. They remained intact just as they are untouched by Hurricane Maria, Category 5. And then of course you have the regional upgrade of the building code and the establishment of a disaster building fund. One minute, right? Yeah. How did that happen? Um, one of the things that I did was to, um, I'm trying to, there's, there's what we call, um, every year the Prime Minister de delivers a budget address to Parliament. And I found a website that is able to, that has archived all of these um, speeches going way back. So I run through the speeches to determine how that evolution is made. Now those, that address actually covers the medium and, and short term, short and medium term strategic development and plans. And by doing that, I was able to, to, to get a sense of how they do that. Here's the, the code book that I use. Here's the, I'm using in vivo to call all of that. It's tremendous work. And here's one of the things that I found, how the conversation heightens after disaster, or after failure I have before and after. And you can see the tremendous conversation. What I've also found is that as the hurricane intensifies and becomes more common, then there is that urgency to actually um, change the way we do, we, we do it. Here is a, a word frequency, and you can see resilient now 
as the most common word in that um, in those documents shift governments of course taking full responsibility climate climatic is the first third one and I want to, to talk about the fundamental issues. One of the vexing things that you still find in all of those reports is the constant struggle to frame responsibility. Who's responsible? Is it we? Is it God? Is it they? And that has driven a lot of the, 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 the not just the conversation, but the policy. It's the, 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 the argument is that sometimes it's beyond our control. Um, we 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 can't prevent the worst, and, and, and therefore we're responsible for, for protection. And on the other side, I give you the rationale for change. Some of the arguments that are being made in those, these documents, why we need to change our policies. However, there's still that dependence on external resources. Because if you frame it externally, then you're going to look externally for resources. There's donor funding, there's technical support, and there's, of course, the CBI, Citizens by Investment, I just want to mention that quickly. But that again is dependent on external funding in which we invite people to become, to invest in the country and give them citizenship. Thank you very much and thanks for your patience. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Margaret Arnold. I'm with the World Bank uh, in, based in Washington, D.C. I'm going to co-present with my colleague, Pivey. Um, we are, I'm going to try and talk fast because we're both presenting in the 15 minutes. So if I talk too fast, just raise your hand and um, let me know. Uh, so we're going to share some information with you about a program we're supporting in West Africa called um, West Africa Coastal Areas Program, or WACA for short. And it aims to help West African countries and communities, more importantly, strengthen resilience to coastal erosion, uh, flooding, um, pollution, and climate change. And um, I just want to go. We're, we're um, um, John mentioned earlier that you know these, the conflict versus climate risks. Um, a lot of what we're dealing with in the West African coast is around coastal erosion from development, from poorly planned development, from illegal sand extraction, from deforestation, right? So um, development issues, not climate change. Climate change is certainly compounding that, um, but we need to keep in mind that this is, um, you know, it's really hard to disentangle all of these risks that poor communities are facing. In other parts of Africa where I'm working, we're really seeing the climate and conflict um, compound each other, and, and you can't really disentangle them. So I think that's, it makes it all the more messy when we're talking about this. So I'll just go back to, oh, and this, just so you know, this is the, on the, this side, the port of Nouakchott in, in Mauritania, and on, just on the other side is Senegal. So you have, you know, the accretion of the sand that's, preve that's preventing the sand being carried to downstream. So you have these cross transboundary issues that um, make this even more messy. So, uh, and this is an image of San Luis in Senegal where, um, you know, there used to be beach here. There's a very long, rich tradition. This is a UNESCO uh, cultural heritage site. Um, and a long tradition and very rich culture of fisher people, communities, and, and the, the situation is, is extremely dire. Um, so if anyone's not familiar with the World Bank, we are a development institution and a bank that gives loans, credits, and grants to sovereign governments. And with that, those funds come a lot of technical support to help them achieve their development goals and, um, you know, design and implement these programs and, um, and also protect people and make sure that things are done in a socially sustainable and environmentally sustainable way so that we achieve our mission, which is to reduce, eliminate extreme poverty and promote shared prosperity, so the distributional aspects of, of, of growth. Um, so the WACA program was uh, launched last fall in, in Senegal and Dakar. 
and um, it's West African governments sign a communique committing themselves to work together um, to protect the coast. It right now consists of two main activities. One is the Waka Resilience Investment Program, which is an initial investment from the World Bank of $225 million uh, for six countries that have signed on, and those are the ones in dark green here. The one you probably can't see is Sao Tome and Principe, which is a tiny island on the towards the bottom there. So those six countries are, are working on country-level projects. Um, but there's also regional aspects. As I said, there's a lot of transboundary issues, so the countries have committed to work together around, around these issues. And then the other part of the WACA program is the WACA platform, which is a mechanism that is being developed um, to mobilize other partners, as this is not something any one agency or country can do themselves. So we're trying to... Um, scale up, and it I makes me think of what Elizabeth said last night, don't talk about scaling up, but replicating um, the uh, to try and mobilize partnerships and resources for around uh, knowledge, finance, and, and dialogue. Um, so the there's these three um, pillars for the WACA platform where we're trying to really crowd in anyone that can and wants to help around the knowledge and technical capacity, the finance, and the dialogue. And then um, across these three pillars, we're developing a, we have a local action and citizen engagement plan um, because we um, want to make sure that all of this is very people-centered and that, uh, and part of this is trying to channel resources directly to communities because as we've been hearing, um, Communities have their own expertise and their own, and uh, based on their lived experience, and it's really important to they need to be treated as equal partners and not beneficiaries in, in all of this. So we're um, trying to make sure that that um, happens. They need to be at the decision making table um, uh, so that they are driving the process. I think we need we always talk about community engagement, but we, it's, I think we need to unpack that and make it much more more meaningful. Um, and then, as, and as part of, of that, we, um, so part of WACA, there's communities along the, this coastline that we're, we are at the point where they are asking to move. Um, and so we're trying to support that process. What we've done is sketch out an initial framework, and please don't take this as a final document. We are very much here. We're not reporting research here. We're here as practitioners to listen and learn. And I want to thank Alex and the whole team for organizing this conference. It's the first one I've been to, maybe it's the first one ever, um, to bring people together around this topic. And I keep finding myself getting uh, emotional, not only because of hearing the heartbreaking stories of what's happening to communities around the world, but also just hearing people sort of speaking my language. And, and it's like finding a tribe, and I hope um, that we can make a lot of connections because we need, uh, you know, we need help doing this. Um, around how you have these conversations, right? So we're... Um, We've sketched out this framework and we're trying to make it very principles-based in terms of making it pro-poor, people-centered, community-led, um, and, you know, and, and anchored in, in long-term visions of, of a culture of safety. What, what communities themselves feel is their vision for a resilient, safe community. Um, so what this did was sketch out sort of, you know, what the inputs you need to make these type of decisions, who needs to be at the table, all the resources, all the questions that need to be asked, and we've heard a lot of them, so I'm not going to go into detail around what they are because we're still in the process of developing this. And then, you know, what are the potential pathways? Can can you adapt in situ? Can some people stay? Can some people go? Can you incentivize people to auto-relocate, or do you have to to move on mass communities and then how you know that's a whole other process of how you do that what we're trying to support with the governments that we're working with is to say that this is not a technical process if you if we approach it as a technical process we will fail this is a social as we're hearing it's a social political it's an existential process right these are existential questions that people are asking because you're talking about people's cultures and self identities as we've heard many times from the really eloquent speakers we've had. So how you have those conversations, um, we're trying to develop um, 
tools around around having those really difficult conversations. Um, so, and we're trying to say that this is this is a process and it takes a long time and you need to invest in the process. And um, so that's going to take time. Unfortunately for us, what we're having to deal with a lot is the emergencies, right, of these images that I showed you of San Luis where people or hundreds of families have already been displaced, you know, and we're, we're calling this planned relocation and that refers to, I, so the term I've liked the most so far is the one Robin I think used last night, which is community relocation. We're calling it planned relocation, but it kind of relates also to our own policies around resettlement, involuntary, when people are displaced from a development project. So we have to be careful around the language we use also. But um, So this is what we're calling it for now. Um, but we're dealing with, um, you know, there's nothing voluntary about what's happening now to communities, which is they're being displaced. So um, we're hoping to do more of this very ex-ante, longer processed work. Um, and there is um, stuff going on in Sao Tome and Principe, and I'm going to pass to pass the word to my colleague Pivey, who's going to talk about how that's been happening. Thanks, Margaret. Um, yeah, so you saw that little uh, image of, of the small island state of Sao Tome and Principe in the Gulf of Guinea. That's um, one place where we've been doing a pilot with the government on how do we move people who actually are asking to be moved. We have a lot of experience in terms of uh, implementing the bank's policies on involuntary resettlement and how we move people when it's a matter of a development project. But here um, in Sao Tome and Principe um, there was a climate change adaptation project wh which originally had nothing to do with actually physically relocating people. But then, um, as a result of very unfortunate uh, surge in storms and, and, the, and their frequency, um, people in the, in the coastal areas, um, mostly fishermen, turned to the project and said, we really need help because we need to go to a safer location. We still want to be fishermen, but we simply can't live here anymore. And this morning, um, I heard Susie say that we don't have the luxury of safer areas anymore, and I do agree, especially in South Dome, you see uh, how dangerous the, the coast areas have become, but we need to get to a safer place because, again, these are uh, people living on an island. As my colleague from Dominica would know, you're not looking to move because that's your home. That's where you want to be. You need something safer, an alternative. Um, so let me try to tell you what we did because, as Margaret was saying, what we're trying to do is build from a participatory process. So we don't want to be there saying that you and you, you need to move here. So how did we start with this? So when people said that we need your help to find areas that are safer for us, we started with comparing, um, doing like a mapping exercise. So what are the risks and what are the projections for the future? And um, we had topographic maps from the 50s and then that helped us determine where the communities used to be versus what was the reality in um, 2011 when this uh, first started. And um, we used maps also to dis in the discussions with communities to show what the science was telling them or was telling us and, and to see what they thought of it. So a, a, um, a process of validation so that this is what we can see. The community was originally much further from the coast, but because of the coastline receding, um, 100 meters in 60 years, the community now was sort of on the edge, I guess, yeah, on the edge. It was right right there where the water was. Um, and then at the same time, we were doing, with the communities, um, maps of their vulnerability. So the communities themselves, thanks, the communities themselves were determining who, when they saw the risk map, they were determining such and such household is more at risk. These are the most vulnerable people. These are the poorest households, so we want these ones to be helped first. So they were doing sort of the prioritization. And we then overlaid those two maps to see the risky areas, the projected risks, and then uh, who was the most vulnerable. Then the next step was, so where do you go? Uh, also that was a participatory process, so that uh, we weren't leading the process that we think you should move here, but it was a process of where can you go and still maintain your livelihood? Because in terms of resettlement, whatever word you call it, relocation, resettlement, retreat, one of the key issues 
is how are the people going to make a living after they move. Um, so there were lots of conversations had around that. Um, luckily, in this case of the community of Malanza, we were able to find a land area uh, that the project could, or the government could acquire from the owners where the community uh, agreed to move. They thought it was a good idea. It was close by to the beach, but it was considered uh, outside of the, the, the main hazard zone. Um, so how then the, then the final step in the process was how do we work to make that area attractive also to others to move in so that we don't get into this cycle where the beach is now cleared, the people have moved, and then within six months there are new people constructing on the beach and we have a new problem and then what do we do with this community? So in Sao Tome the government is actually trying to make this safe area um, a growth pole, an expansion zone, if you will, so that people who are looking for a place to move to will not use the beach anymore, but they will actually take the initiative and go to this area, which will offer um, socio-economic socio um, infrastructure, services, and it has that uh, benefit of, of the livelihood aspect as well. But this process has not concluded yet, so we're still working on it, but it's just an example of what we would like to do on a larger scale under WACA. Um, but as has been said many times over already today, it's extremely difficult. We would like to be proactive, but we end up being reactive because of the, the emergent nature of, of, of the issue. Thank you very much. couple minutes um, late we're gonna go maybe five ten minutes into lunch but if you all you know need to get going feel free feel free to do that we're gonna take a few questions from the audience instead of hearing more from me Does anyone have a question? You want to start? Um, so this is for Paivi for the question in, around um, Sao Tome and Principe. Um, has there been any consideration of kind of rezoning the unsafe areas as either a park or a protected area and kind of either replanting mangroves or doing something that would also foster a kind of longer term resilience in that area and prevent people from moving back in? Yeah, definitely. Can you hear me? Yeah. I think it's on. Yeah. Sorry. Um, so there has been um, efforts to actually do that, and there's what has been put in place is a, like a community monitoring system, if you will, to make sure that there's no new construction um, coming up on the beach. Because, to be quite honest, uh, during some of the, the visits to the area, it's clear that people are still building. I mean, there's information is widely available. It's been discussed many times over, but it's an attractive zone. There's free land now. It's close to the to the sea, so. But yeah, so the community measures uh, are in place. Uh, there's talk about um, putting uh, vegetation there uh, and just trying through awareness raising to um, make sure that people do not use that area for that purpose anymore. Hi, thanks to all the panelists for the presentation. Um, they were really interesting. I have two questions. The first is for John. Um, so I'm sympathetic to your argument um, and especially your moral argument, but I'm wondering if you've seen any arguments that you found persuasive against um, this idea that it's really hard to isolate climate as a driver of migration. So which makes climate passports less feasible. Um, so basically, how do you respond to them? to that issue where there, people might be moving for other reasons but still would want to access the benefits of a climate passport. Um, and the second question, I'll just do both, um, is for both Ted and Sandy. So Sandy presented this, this cost-benefit analysis um, for, and basically it says that Northeastern and Western European coasts make most sense financially to adapt. But we heard from Ted that 70% of Dominica's population lives on the coast, but we also saw, that, saw in the map that Dominica was in red. Um, so given that for an island like Dominica, most of the population is living on the coast, but there's no financial 
argument for adaptation, although there are equity, social, cultural arguments, what are actually the financial mechanisms for adaptation in those places? Yeah, no, I think that's a really good question. And I, I'm glad that you brought up and some of my colleagues brought up this idea of disentangling factors. Like every time I've gone um, to a place to do a story about climate and relocation or really climate and anything, it, it's always a mix of factors, right? Like I think in Central America, w we use data sets to try to find locations where droughts seem to be the main driver, where homicide rates are going down, that, that sort of thing. Um, but still, in many places, it, there are a multitude of factors sort of combining to force someone to move. In Puerto Rico, um, you would hear, you know, I spent a lot of time in motels in Florida where a lot of people were, were moving. Central Florida was sort of like the hot spot for relocation after, after Hurricane Maria. Um, and you would hear a range of things. Like some people would say, you know, I, I didn't have a place to live. It became too expensive. I didn't have work to go back to. I wanted my kids to have a better education. Their school was closed. All those things are related to the hurricane in some respects, but they may be something that you've been thinking about for 10 years and then here's the event that pushes you to actually make that move. I think what the folks at Potsdam are arguing is that rather than looking at it individually to take the Nansen approach of looking at this as a, a systematic problem and saying here are locations that are especially at risk, here are territories um, where this is clearly a problem and saying that people in those territories would ha then have some um, extra right uh, to relocate if they so chose. I think looking at it individually would be almost impossible because even in interviewing people one-on-one, -on -one, it one, that takes a long time and two, every person's decision is very complex and multifaceted. And then for, for us, I, I think we've had a reprieve from the framing of the responsibility. So if you say it's an act of God, then basically you people resign themselves to, to whatever the consequences are. Or you look to God and, and it's, it's very telling that you actually find that in the writing, that it's an act of God. Or it's because of God why, why, why we're not, we're no, you know. We've been saved or spared uh, that effect. One of the things that I have also found is that when, when the actors around the policy debate think about it the same way, nothing is going to happen. Nobody's going to change. It's, it's when somebody decides to, to, to contest that prevailing thinking and framing that you would have the change. We've had some reprieve from international donors, but the thinking is now that 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 experience is not going to be the same forever. And so we're beginning to shift. So what we've had is what we call citizenship by investment, where you invite people to invest and, and they get citizenship in return. So we've been able to use some of that money to, to, to address some of those issues. But I think what, what, what the shift is I'm now seeing is what I call an adaptive developmental approach, where you now incorporate the threat the risk and vulnerability into the policies, plans, and operations of various institutions from national all the way down to, to, to the local level. How long that is the, 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 the money flow is going to last, I do not know. And so the, the final argument is to build back better. So whenever we build, we, we, so we've had a change in, in the building codes and so on to, to reflect that, that kind of thinking. Yeah. Um. So, yes. Um, so, yeah. Maybe just yeah, to come back also to your question. I think. I mean, it's a very important question. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I think I'd just make one point. I mean, in terms of clarifying um, this issue of, of of whether what we're doing is a cost benefit analysis, which I think is important to make. I mean, <clears throat> strictly speaking, um, looking at. Um, uh, across all those different scenarios um, for each segment of the global coastline, um, and, and then looking at, I mean, it, it, there's no way to aggregate the expected value across all of those different scenarios. Um, so in that sense, what we've done is not strictly a cost-benefit analysis, but we've rather said, like, within each scenario, um, um, there is, in some cases, within one scenario, there is a cost-benefit analysis being done, and there's a case to be made that, that we have positive cost benefit within a, a scenario at a given place. And that's important to say because um, the point that we're making there is that there are some areas where regardless, we, we don't know how to deal with these very unlikely but still possible uh, high-end scenarios. And 
the point we're trying to make there is that even in that context, there's an economic argument to be made, um, regardless of the uncertainty for adaptation. I mean, to your question about where, the, you know, in Dominica, we don't see that economic argument, then, I mean, I think there, there are a number of other arguments that, that need to be made for adaptation and how and how we fund that, and through the loss and damage discussion um, within the UNFCCC, for, for example, um, the, the, I mean, th this is where those discussions need to happen, and, yeah, kind of this robust analysis um, looking at cost-benefit across all the scenarios um, is, is, is is just one strand of argumentation that, that is maybe not relevant there, and so we need to look for, 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 for other ways, uh, and, and certainly there's a case to be made there. Yeah. Yes, uh, thank you all for really stimulating the presentation. Very thoughtful. One question I have, and it's based upon the hearing each of these in the series, is that one thing that seems a little bit missing is the, I think, very profound I'll just offer one quick anecdote. It's not a, uh, it doesn't solve that problem, but I, I think that's an important thing to, to, to think about clearly. Um, just kind of a counterexample, like a few years ago I did a story on a family from the Marshall Islands that half of them moved to Springdale, Arkansas, um, which is a place that had a fairly sizable Marshallese community and, and some of those people now are moving for uh, reasons related to, to climate change. Um, and there, I, you know, I talked to a lot of people just living in, in Arkansas about what was happening, which I thought was this really interesting, profound thing. And a lot of people were either unaware of it or sort of curious about it, but there was not the same hostility that you hear around discussions of migration from Mexico and Central America. I think there wasn't like this pre-narrative in people's heads that here's this issue that I feel a certain political way about and therefore I'm, you know, going to impart that on <laughs> this whole group of people. I think it was more of a, uh, like an intrigue and a curiosity and I think there were interesting interactions between the community, and, uh, the Marshallese community and the local, you know, Arkansas um, residents that largely were not, didn't seem like they were conflict as much. And in Florida, with people from Puerto Rico coming, there were uh, issues raised around school crowding and ways in which, you know, that was affecting people there and there was a little bit more more friction. I don't know how you break down those barriers so people think of it anew and as an individual to individual or like our community kind of way, but I think when that happens and you see it as just a local thing as opposed to part of this uber political narrative that that really helps. In, in the case of the, the Pitit Savan community that had to be moved after Erica, that was a huge struggle. I mean, you can't make people move if they don't want to move. So not everyone moved. So some stayed for whatever reason. They had mortgages that, and, and homes that just been constructed and they felt that um, um, the, the specific or the size of the of their location was not as affected. So, but, but one of the issues, of course, it created was a continued safety in that space and access to the community because um, Eric also disrupted um, the road network and so there was extreme difficulty but somehow you know they were left alone because <laughs> if they you can't make people move if they don't want to move so that's that's a dilemma but 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 the the fundamental is trying to influence people to move getting them to see the dangers educating them but you also have to deal with the psychological impact of that movement as well not only for them and i and i want to underscore but for the children i think in those conversations we don't talk about the kids and those things from my personal experience as a student having gone through a huge hurricane the traumatic experiences often are not felt until decades after and that's when your body reacts to it and, and I remember doing that research and literally broke down in tears, just, just broke down. Because for the first time, I was experiencing the trauma. 
of, of, of that because you just shove that stuff and don't think about it. And then you come face to face with it eventually and you have to deal with it. So it's not just the adults, but also we have to pay attention to what happens to the children. Um, can I just respond on the, so this, this isn't happening in the West Africa, uh, the Waka program, but in other parts of Africa we have projects in the Horn and the Great Lakes that are taking, working with people in IDP camps and, and in communities and the, the focus is, is to focus equally, if not more so, on the receiving communities, right? To focus on improving their, because most of the receiving communities are very poor and they're dealing with structural poverty issues anyway, so focusing on improving services, education, everything for them, so that it's not a burden to receive people, and um, we're having good results with that. Do you want to add anything? Yeah, and I think it's also part of the conversation that you have with the people who are moving is also to engage the receiving community in the same understanding of that there is this huge risk and what does it mean and who is vulnerable because people do understand that the, I, I do feel like people do understand the broader responsibility when it really hits home that they, those people don't have another choice. Sort of big picture thing of the 50 cases that we looked at there were three kinds of receiving community issues uh, emerging. One was concerns about infrastructure capacity, like, you know, can we really uh, take absorb this incoming population? Second was about compatibility. <coughs> we don't want them here kind of uh, <laughs> issue. And the uh, third was uh, uh, about livelihoods and jobs and economic sort of issues that's going <laughs> 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 so, 